all's well that ends well, or something like that? An odd mixture of worry and embarrassment ebbed from Eins's bones as he looked down at the fallen form of Baroness Saradnik. Holmiot cradled her in his tentacles, his single eye fixed into a look of concern. The disaster that Eins had feared would happen hadn't, but Shiltier had created a disaster of a different kind. Holmiot, Shiltier whispered to the Roper, this is your chance. Eins chopped the overly excited vampire again. We should move her to a place where she may rest undisturbed, he said. Holmiot, take her down to the sixth floor. By your command, Ein Summer. The Roper secured the young woman and left the cave. Too late, Irons realized the highly problematic image it created. He took one last look at the cavern before returning to the catacombs outside, but the Roper was long gone. Not far away, Oriol Omega was examining the aftermath of the Baroness escapades across the second floor. Ein Summer. I saw something quite unsettling just now. I instructed Holmia to bring Lady Zaradnik to a resting place on the sixth floor. She's undead, so does she even need rest? How did she faint, anyway? Shouldn't she be immune to those sorts of effects? The world was a strange place, and that strangeness wasn't limited to harmless oddities. Is that so? The poor woman, of all of the five worsts, it had to be him. Ah, nothing happened, just so you know. Unfortunately, Shiltier added. Eins bopped Shiltier on the head again, but, this time, she emitted a heated moan. More importantly, he withdrew his hand and cleared his throat, how goes your analysis of the, well, we can't exactly call it a battle. The Baroness fight across the second floor was an eye-opening affair. He had always felt that the test with the workers was lacking in many ways and that much had now been made plain. Why is abjuration so unpopular around here again? A single counter-divination effect had effectively blinded the defense coordinator and thus her ability to effectively respond to a single, well-equipped threat who opted for a low-impact approach. It wasn't as if the spell in question was out of reach for the natives. It also wasn't impossible for the natives to achieve similar sets of equipment if the rest of the world was advanced as many asserted. Thus, the Baroness probably wasn't unique in her combination of combat and infiltration capabilities. I mostly understand how events played out, I and Summer, Oriol said, but it feels like many of the things that happened should have been impossible. Yet, this is our reality now, I and said. As a commander, what would you say our most glaring weaknesses are? Many factors came together to generate this result, Oriol said. First would be the lack of information we had to work with. With divination measures failing and most of the mercenaries disabled, our surveillance is woefully lacking. Lady Zaradnik could simply hide whenever it suited her, and the longer she hid, the more effort it took to keep track of all of the possible actions she might have undertaken. Eins nodded in agreement. To put it simply, Nazarek's defenses were designed to face level 100 players. As such, the anti-stealth measures in their defensive scheme came in the form of mercenaries on par or better than the eyeball corpses he could summon. All of them had true sight and boasted detection abilities that surpassed auras, and many of them had a suite of annoying skills designed to hamper invaders until the combat-oriented mercenaries could engage them. With Nazarek in low-maintenance mode, however, all of those assets were disabled. The reconnaissance-capable mercenaries that were still active, namely the Eight Edge Assassins and Hanzos, were deployed outside of Nazarek and limited in availability. The free pops that now served as the guild base's regular security force weren't ever meant to be a security force in the first place. They were simply elements that added flavor to the tomb and most could be safely ignored by high-level players. I probably have a solution to the surveillance issue, Ein said. And I believe it is less of an actual issue and more the fact that our previous experiment with native subjects didn't fully explore their potential as we might have in the Sorceress Kingdom. What other factors do you consider a problem? The next issue concerns the Pops, Ein Summer, Oriol replied. The vast majority are mindless and thus can only carry out simple instructions. Without a proper distribution of commanders to oversee Nazarek's assets, our responsiveness leaves much to be desired. This, in turn, compounds with our surveillance issues and the various realities that come with this new world. Could Elder Liches not be employed for the role? Elder Liches are a potential option since they are suited to commanding undead forces but they do have a distinct flavor that can be exploited. The natives seem to be well versed in this, in fact, 
I would almost say that the near-universal antagonistic relationship between the undead and the living in this world has led to a situation where everyone knows how to fight the undead and are more than willing to do so. We have been overpowering all opposition thus far, but that is no guarantee it will always be the case. Once again, Irons nodded silently in agreement. He wasn't certain whether it was because of her commander job class levels or her settings in general, but the somewhat reclusive Oreo Lomaga was one of the most observant, rational, and shrewd NPCs in Nazarick as the area guardian of the Cherry Blossom Sanctuary and the commander of the Great Tomb's ultimate line of defense on the eighth floor, she was not only readily critical of what she saw as issues, but also actively endeavored to come up with solutions for them. In that case, Ains asked, what would you recommend? It isn't as if we can't use Elder Liches, Oreo answered, we simply need to train them out of their template. As Ein Summer has so abundantly proven, having the undead act outside of the natives' expectations casts all of their preconceptions and thus preparations to the wind. With sufficient experience, the Elder Liches working in the outside world may be employed for the task. What about until then? I believe that expanding the area guardian's responsibilities will assist greatly in our responsiveness to threats. They aren't commanders, but anything is better than our current extreme top-down approach to defense. Expanding their responsibilities, do you mean something like having them not only defend their rooms, but also the corridors in the vicinity? That would be the most straightforward application, Ein Summer, but not the only one. For instance, if we spread Q Hyuku's family all over the place, they could act as a makeshift alarm system. Their mundane detection ability is poor, but if one of them gets stepped on, ah oh please don't let anyone know that I made such a suggestion. A quiet smile that was at least three parts mischief traced over Oriole's lips. Irons could easily imagine the uproar that would occur if he went through with that particular suggestion. We'll probably have to pass on that one, Irons said, but your point is well taken. I'll have the area guardians of each floor get together and we'll see what they can come up with. Do you have anything else to add? Beyond that, Iron Summer, it is difficult to say. A commander is only as effective as the information that they have and the resources at their disposal. Once our defenses are reorganized, they will have to be further assessed. Umu. In that case, we're done here. Oriole folded her hands in front of her lap and bowed respectfully. Then I shall be returning to my post, Iron Summer. Please enjoy the rest of the tournament. The clacking of Oriole's getter receded down the corridor. Ainz glanced at Shiltier, who had been standing quietly at his side the entire time. Speaking of the tournament, he said, shouldn't you be preparing for it as well? Oh, but I have been, Iron Summer. Dressed as she was, the words didn't carry much weight. Her apparent preparations didn't in any way resemble what someone facing a major battle would undergo. Much to Shiltier's disappointment, Ainz left the second floor to rejoin the event on the sixth. A festival was being held outside the arena, acting as a battleground of sorts for Nazarick's non-combatants. The aroma of the food stands wafted through the air, tempting passers-by with their offerings. Yaki soba. Get your super addictive yaki soba here. Grilled corn and squid. We've got beer, too. Cotton candy. Candied apples. Chocolate bananas. The homunculus maids were, of course, the main customers. They walked together in twos and threes, often with one food item or another sticking out of their mouths. Ainz could only sigh whimsically at the sight. Suzuki Satoru's memories of food mostly consisted of flavored nutrient paste and his old world certainly didn't have anything like this, at least not for the common man. He often bemoaned the irony of having an entire fantasy world before him, yet being unable to experience it as he formerly could. Ein Summer. Aura's voice sounded from somewhere in the crowd. She appeared a moment later, squeezing through the throng with a bright smile on her face. Ein Summer, welcome back. Is everything all right? It was nothing to worry about. How are the festivities coming along? Great. The first performance starts in an hour, actually, something weird happened just now. Weird? Yeah. People were saying that Holney had caught a woman. I went to look and the woman turned out to be Baroness Sarodnik. Ah, I'm not exactly sure how it happened, but she ended up at Holniot's place. I instructed him to bring her over here. Where did they go, by the way? He disappeared into an empty cabin with her, or as gaze slid to the side. I don't think anyone's willing to find out what they're doing. Aura, you shouldn't judge a man by his tentacles. What the hell did I just say? 
Of course. Aura replied with a completely serious expression. Holmyat was created by the Supreme Beings as the worst hero, so no one would ever judge him for that. He's carrying out Ein Summer's orders, too. How did it end up that way? Ein's considered clarifying his statement, but he was afraid that it would end up in an awkward place. Aura was still a child by elf standards, after all. Ma, I'm sure they'll join us later. Let's take a look around, shall we? Yes, Ein Summer. The crowd parted to make way, with cheers accompanying his every footstep. It was how he would have liked E. Rantle to be, well, maybe not to the same extremes, but the citizens still had a long way to go regarding their support of the Sorcerer King. Being undead was a bigger obstacle than he initially thought it would be. You've been doing an excellent job officiating the matches so far, Aura. Is it something you enjoy? If I recall correctly, you also did it that other time. Hmm, I wonder. It's more like I end up being the one doing it, I guess? It must be because you have a very energetic voice, Ein said. Conveying excitement is very important in that sort of job. Though he said so, his statement wasn't the product of good memories. As a grunt in sales, he had to do it even if it killed him. Putting on a smile and displaying enthusiasm about products that he had no clue about always left him feeling empty after he met with company clients. In many cases, some of the goods seemed so sketchy that he felt like he was cheating people, and he probably was. His was a cutthroat world where people cut corners wherever they could. Not that anyone seemed to care. If a machine that he sold to a company killed dozens or even hundreds of its employees, that company wouldn't give a damn so long as it resulted in greater profits than before. There were always more poor and desperate people scratching up a living outside of the arcologies to replace the dead and maimed, after all. They stopped to watch some of the denizens try to win prizes at a shooting gallery. Someone had gotten the guild blacksmith to craft a handful of low-level magical guns, which fired their default ammo at a group of targets made from higher-tier materials. It wasn't exactly the same as the historical records that one of his friends had shown him in the past, but it was close enough. Come to think of it, where did they get the ideas for all of this? Who built the stands for the festival? Eins asked. Um. Some of my area guardians went to do some research for the festival in the Great Library, Aura answered. They said they found all of this there. Ah, I guess that makes sense. Yggdrasil took every opportunity to push its microtransactions on the player base, so someone had probably purchased some sort of festival bundle for the guild base. Eind Ulgaon had more than a few impulsive shoppers who couldn't resist special promotions and filled rows of shelves in Ashurbanipal with their spoils. An exaggerated bang sounded from the range. The shot went wide, putting a hole in the back of the stall. Isn't that dangerous? Eins asked. I don't think so, Aura answered. Those guns are so terrible that they can't hit anything. That's a problem too, isn't it? The stand operator, a half golem area guardian from the fourth floor named Gororo, did look rather smug. A bullet bounced off of his shoulder and he let out a mocking snort. How about giving it a shot, Aura? Me? I don't have any mana, so. Ah, that entirely slipped my mind. He wondered how a gunner would fare. As if reading his thoughts, Shizu and Entamu emerged from the crowd. The pink-haired sniper stepped up to the counter, flipping a Yggdras and gold coin over to the half-golem operator. Shizu raised her weapon, but then Gororo went to stand in her way. H hold on there, Miss Shizu. You have to use one of our weapons. Shizu stared silently at the operator. She picked up one of the weapons lying on the counter and scrutinized it with an expressionless look. This weapon. It sucks. If you don't like it, the half golem crossed his arms, then don't play too hard. Entima said around a mouthful of grilled squid. The muzzle of the shoddy magical gun came up and a shot rang out. A metallic clink sounded as the magical round hit not the target downrange from Shizu but the post on the other side of the target beside it. That can't be right. No matter how terrible that weapon is, it should still perform better than a mundane weapon in Shizu's hands. Another shot rang out. A divot appeared in the ground a meter in front of the target. Ainz's gaze went from the ground to the target, trying to figure out what was going on. Is it just me, he said, or are those targets equipped with armor? They are, Iron Summer, Aura replied. Why? because it's a battle between the stand and any challengers, right? Why would they let them win? I knew this was too normal looking to be true. 
Combat in their new world, as Ainz had quickly learned, did not follow the rules that one might expect in a real world. Instead, the outcomes of any action were close to what one would expect from Yggdrasil. A shoddy, low-level weapon shooting unenchanted projectiles in what was effectively an auto-attack had no chance of successfully landing a hit on the armor adorning the targets. Full burst. A storm of gunfire lit the stand as Shizu activated one of her gunner's skills. By the end of it, the barrel of Shizu's gun, which was supposed to be a bolt-action rifle, glowed an angry orange and the stand had more holes than stand. The armored target, however, stood completely unscathed. Shizu scanned her handiwork and nodded once before stomping away. The stand collapsed a few moments later. What was the point of that stand, exactly? He half said to himself. Oh, Ein Summer, Gororo emerged from the debris, I'm so glad that you asked. The challenges to this stand experience what it must be like for the natives of this world to face the great tomb of Nazarick. As you can see, the target is completely intact. Ein eyed the remains of the stand. If the target was Nazarick, then what did the stand itself represent? I see you've put quite a bit of thought into it, he said. It's unfortunate that it's ruined now. This one is humbled by Iron Summer's praise. There's no need to worry about the stand, we can have a replacement made in no time. He glanced at the bystanders. It didn't look like anyone found the explanation strange. If anything, they were touched by the notion. As he left the stand, he overheard more than a few chatting excitedly about experiencing the futility of the shooting gallery. After perusing some of the festival's other offerings, Aura led him to the stage where the afternoon talent show would soon begin. A gilded throne had been prepared for him on the front row, looking painfully out of place with its surroundings. Won't this block the view of the people behind me? Heinz asked, looking at the back of the chair that Heinz Summer is sitting on is far better than just watching the performances. Aura answered. His eyes went to the crowd. Indeed, they were mostly arranged behind the throne, making it look like an explosion had scoured away the rest of the audience. Let's have everyone sit more normally, shall we? Heinz said, the performers must have practiced hard for this moment, after all. Heinz went to sit down while Aura went to disperse the audience. The stage had been constructed out of wood harvested from the sixth floor, coming complete with a pit where the Eric String Orchestra would accompany the various acts. Having all those doppelganger faces looking up from the pit at me like that is actually sort of creepy. If he recalled correctly, most had already stored the forms of various natives in the Sorceress Kingdom and beyond. A few of them had already performed abroad, most notably playing the role of the Maid Demons in Ainz's first battle against Yaldabaoth in the Holy Kingdom. Others had assignments elsewhere, playing roles that allowed them to investigate native technology, magic, trade, and politics, but they had all returned to participate in the festival. Aura returned to his side, opting to stand at his shoulder. Heinz looked around for a performance schedule, but he couldn't find any pamphlets lying around. What act are you most looking forward to? Heinz asked. Hmm, the evil lords are putting on another dramatic production, so probably that. I see, but shouldn't they be in the fighting tournament rather than the talent portion? There's no rule that says they can't enter the talent portion, Aura replied. Their acts for Nazareth Talent Night are super popular, too. I think people would be disappointed if they didn't make a showing. Admittedly, Ainz did enjoy the performances of the Evil Lords. Their dramatic productions usually cast villainous masterminds as the protagonists, and the plot of each story had plenty of the deception, scheming and manipulation that was expected of such characters. Personally, he thought the best part was that the good guys were always built up before it was revealed to them that they were nothing more than puppets dancing in the palm of the protagonist's hand. I suppose so, Ian said. Oh, I heard that they were producing a series. Is that true? It is. Aura nodded excitedly. The pilot for Dance of the Blind is today. Fool's Conquest is being put on tomorrow. Which series they'll do will depend on the audience's reception. Light applause filled the air as Chokmul crawled to the conductor's stand. The amorphous heteromorph bowed deeply to Ainz before straightening to turn his eye stalks to the audience. It looks like a lot of people have too much time on their hands, Chokmul sighed. I suppose I should thank everyone for bothering to come. Our first act features an urinist painkill. I won't fault anyone if they vomit during the performance. With that, Chokmul turned around and raised his baton with a bulbous pseudopod. 
The ceiling of the sixth floor dimmed and the clear skies were replaced by a field of stars as a single woodwind filled the air with a meandering melody. Cold white lighting illuminated Neuronist as she undulated onto the stage. W.H. What in the world is this? The rest of the Eric String Orchestra joined its soloist, playing a score that sounded like a chorus of tortured cats. Neuronist wobbled and swayed in rough time with the music, filling Irons with an indescribable feeling. Then, to his great dismay, she stopped a dance in place directly in front of him. Neuronist locked her intense gaze upon Irons, the tentacles on her face whipping wildly as she writhed and jiggled her grey folds suggestively at him. He wished he had a stomach so he could vomit. Then, just when he thought it couldn't get worse, Neuronist hooked a curved black fingernail on the strap of her leather bra. Before she could yank off her top, the brain eater flopped onto the stage with a heavy thud. Foul. Oro scowled as she lowered her bow, that's totally a foul. This act is cancelled. The dark elf frowned as Neuronist was dragged off of the stage. A pair of homunculus maids appeared to mop the stage clean after Neuronist was removed. Honestly, Aura muttered, why are Nazarix women also? Eins chuckled and patted Aura lightly on the head. You are such a responsible girl, he said. That must be why I put you in charge of the others. Eins summer, Aura fidgeted under his touch, I'm not a little kid. E everyone's looking at us. The next act was a manzai routine between sous chef and Eclair, followed by a skit performed by a group of homunculus maids. By the time they reached the Evil Lord's act at the end, the venue's seating was packed. Dramatic music rose from the orchestra and fiery lighting filled the stage. Illusion magic created the scene of a forest village set aflame and the first actor dashed into view. Anol? We don't have any, ah, uh, it must be one of our doppelgangers. The Anol drew a three-meter-tall war bow, sending an arrow the size of a scorpion bolt into the darkness. Is anyone alive? She shouted, is. Dear. A short anon ran onto the stage. Herfa. Where are the others? We are fighting as best as we can, Herfa said. The undead are everywhere. What about the villagers? They are being escorted to the hills. The old and infirm insisted on staying behind to buy time. The fools. Dia snarled. Every corpse that we leave behind will be raised as an abomination that will hunt our people to the ends of the world. In the background, an illusory branch crashed into the ground in flames. Ains leaned forward in his seat in anticipation. And what would you have them do, matron? Herfa shouted, limp away, dragging down our people until death and despair take us all. Better that they die proud in their purpose, giving nothing that the undead crave. A low growl rose from Dia's throat. Her nose turned down as she looked at the blanket of ashes on the forest floor. Herfa placed a paw on her shoulder. We've done everything we can, my love, Herfa said. There was barely any warning. I can't even think of where these undead might have come from. Our forest was always full of light and life. And now it is full of flames and death, Dia's bat. Let's. The Nol matron froze, the rounded ears atop her head raised and alert. She drew an arrow from the quiver at her hip. They're close, Dia said. We should leave. It is too late for that. A sterile voice sounded from above. Its rich dark robes fluttering in the fiery tempest, an overlord floated down to stand before the two knolls. All around them, the figures of various undead appeared through the smoke. Oh, it's Falvius. They sure went out of their way to cast a lot of characters. The local knoll matron, I presume, Falvius said. You will make a fine addition to my collection. Herfa stepped in front of Dia. Run, Dia, he said. Our people need you and you're strong enough to break through and escape. I'll hold this bastard off. Hold me off? Fulvius' tone rose by a notch, Richard Mortal, is your mind so minuscule that you fail to comprehend the existence that stands before you? The only thing I need to comprehend is that you're a walking pile of unliving filth. Herfa snarled, get out of here, dear. Despite Herfa's urgings, dear remained frozen in place. Fulvius raised his arm, pointing a bony finger at Herfa. Die. Herfa collapsed. Fulvius turned his attention to Dia, his robe sending up a swirl of cinders with every step. The ignorant fool, he said. He never noticed you were already paralyzed by my powers. Now, what shall you serve me as? A death knight? A dread ghast? Or perhaps something more spectral would be more to your taste? So many options. Ah, but before any of that, suffer. 
Fulvius pressed his palm to Dia's abdomen. A strangled gasp rose from the Noll's throat as she withered under the Overlord's touch. Your people will perish, Fulvius said. All of them. Worry not, however, it is only natural. The goal of all life is death, after all. The Overlord reached out to inflict another negative energy drain on the helpless Noll. Then, a blade descended from on high, shattering Fulvius' arm into a thousand fragments. What? Fulvius recoiled. That's as far as you go, abomination. On wings of darkness, the evil lord of greed descended to land between Fulvius and Dia. He yanked his scythe out of the ground, brandishing it against the overlord with a flourish. Erwith. He called out, Dvrith. A storm of black arrows rained from the sky, destroying the undead army cutting off their escape. The figures of countless gnolls emerged to replace them. Fulvius looked back and forth, then leveled his burning crimson gaze on the interloper. You, who are you? There was no report of. The evil lord scythe separated the overlord's skull from his shoulders. His robe formed a dark puddle on the ground as his body fell. Obliteration is the only answer to the undead, the evil lord said. With Fulvius fall, the effect holding Dia in place was dispelled. The null fell weakly to the ground, her ragged breaths barely audible over the crackle of the flames. A null mystic came to administer treatment, and, a few moments later, Dia pushed herself up on one arm. Despite just having been rescued, she looked up at her savior with unveiled suspicion. A demon? I have been called that on many occasions, the evil lord of greed turned his blindfolded gaze on Dia, then smiled, but I would rather be addressed by my name. I am called Samel, and it appears that we share a common enemy. Ludmilla took in a lungful of air as she stirred from her oblivious state. Green, earthy odors hung in the air, suggesting that she wasn't in the same place as before. Additionally, there were two other scents that she immediately recognized, one much stronger than the other. Her eyes fluttered open. Lord Mayor? H. Hello. She looked up at the wooden ceiling for a moment before turning her attention to the rest of her surroundings. The walls, floor and furniture all appeared to be crafted out of wooden decorations suited for the daughter of a wealthy family were tastefully placed around the room. Actually, I don't know what half of these items are. Ludmilla set up, finding Lord Mayor seated at the end of the bed she had been lying in. He had his back against the wall and a book was open across his lap. She narrowed her eyes at the open window beyond him. It's night time? How long have I been out for? Ah, it's not night time, Lord Mayor told her. We just turned the daylight off, I beg your pardon, my lord? Um, they changed the lighting from day to night because they're doing something at the tournament festival. She still didn't get it. Ludmilla checked under her covers to make sure that she was decent, then decided to use the opportunity to equip her civilian garb. Once she was done, she pulled back her blanket and swung her legs over the side of the bed, reaching for her boots on the floor. How much time has passed? Ludmilla asked, and how did I get here? The last I remember, I was having a conversation with Lord Holniot in his area and then His Majesty appeared. She cringed at the recollection of the undoubtedly poor showing on her part. Why did she have to be so utterly hopeless in the presence of the Sorcerer King? Holniot brought you over, Lord Mayor told her. He took you to an empty cabin at first, but then some weird rumors started so I moved you to our house. Is Lord Holniot still around? I should apologize for all of the trouble that I've caused. He went back home as soon as I picked you up, Lord Mayor said. It's been a few hours since then. H. How are you feeling? Holniot said that you fainted, but is that even possible? Ludmilla rose and stretched out of habit. Out of the corner of her eye, she noticed that the door to the room had opened a crack and someone was peeking inside. Someone is looking in on us, she said. Is it a member of your household staff? Huh? Oh. I guess. We took in three elves a while ago and Lord Irons gave them jobs. They're pretty annoying. Ah, them. I recall you mentioning that before. MHM. Ludmilla took her boots over to a table near the middle of the room. She pulled out a chair and sat down, then felt an odd sensation as the piece of furniture grew to fit her. About my fainting, Ludmilla said as she pulled on a boot. Are other undead not affected by His Majesty's presence? Lord Mayor looked up from his book, a tiny frown crossing his lips. There was something that Shiltia said back when, oh. But can that make the undead faint? I don't remember there being any status effects like that. From what I've seen, Ludmilla said, 
Different types of undead are affected by His Majesty's presence in different ways. The elder liches of the Cats of Cabal, for instance, are filled with awe. Lady Shiltia's handmaidens seem to experience something similar to their mistress. There aren't many other examples that I know of yet, but I think that each type of undead is affected differently. If she were to broadly describe it, the undead became more alive in the ways that suited them in the Sorcerer King's presence, displaying reactions generally reserved for the living. Hey, that's interesting, Lord Mayor said. I should ask Curie about it. Ludmilla pulled on her other boot. I wouldn't recommend that, my lord, Ludmilla said. Miss Alpha is a stern woman. Lord Mayor seemed to shrink in on himself as if imagining what the director might do to him. Ludmilla had heard some stories from Liam and Say, but, aside from nearly punching a hole in a classroom wall, nothing the orphanage director did seemed that extreme. She fished a mirror out of her infinite haversack and placed it on the table. Strangely, her ordeals hadn't left much of a mess aside from a bit of grime collective while making her way around the second floor. Have you heard anything from Lady Shiltier, my lord? No. Want me to contact her for you, let's not. Ludmilla put her things away and went over to the window. They were in a meadow surrounded by tall woodland and only some of the vegetation looked familiar. I've seen some of these plants before, she said. Aren't they the ones you've placed in Glaza's keeping? Yeah, Lord Mayor replied. Things are going well in Warden's Vale, so I'm hoping that we can introduce more soon. Speaking of which, one of those plants ate a pair of socks the other day, are we going to have to worry about plants going into people's dresses and eating people's clothing? They broke into someone's house and ate their socks. Not exactly, my lord, Ludmilla said. The Lionham sisters like the feel of the grass under their bare feet and one of them left their socks in the hall. We learned, too late, that at least one of those plants can devour fabric. Glaza will have to speak with the plants about it, Lord Mayor told her. They should listen to her, but let me know if they don't. Outside, the starry night was abruptly replaced by a sunny day. Practically speaking, it didn't make any difference to Ludmilla, but the idea that day and night could be switched so casually was mind-boggling. Mind-boggling and problematic. Doesn't doing this interfere with natural cycles? A second observer joined the first at the door. Ludmilla backed away from the window. I shouldn't impose on you any longer, my lord, she said. Out of curiosity, how far is your territory from Lady Shiltier's? Um, three floors? Three floors? Un. This is the sixth floor. Shiltier's lowest floor is the third. Did that mean they were even deeper underground? Was the scenery outside of the window something like a highly advanced version of the underground farms she was building in her domain? An underground forest? If so, she was falling far short of the Sorcerer King's expectations when he had first explained the concept to her. She would have to realign her vision to more closely match what she had seen. Another face appeared at the door. Lord Mayor closed the book on his lap and tossed it on his pillow. We should go, he said. The door swung open. Three elf women in maid uniforms rushed into the room. You mustn't, Lord Mayor, the pink-haired one said. Humans are dangerous, said the blue-haired one. She'll turn you into a slave. The last, a blonde with short cropped hair cried. Lord Mayor turned his head to look up at Ludmilla. Why you're going to turn me into a slave? he asked. Slavery is illegal in the Sorceress Kingdom, my lord, Ludmilla answered. See? She dodged the question. We won't let you turn Lord Mayor into your toy. The three elf maids moved to interpose themselves between Lord Mayor and Ludmilla. Though their ire was misdirected, she felt that their desire to defend the master of their household was admirable. Perhaps some directions will do, Ludmilla said. What's the most expedient way to the surface, my lord? The surface? Lord Mayor's voice came from behind the wall of elf maids. Didn't you just arrive a few hours ago? I did, but, well, I don't really feel like talking about it right now. What are the chances of Lady Shultier appearing around here, by the way? MMH, she should be preparing for the tournament like the others, so pretty slim until her fights are over. Lord Irons said that everyone should enjoy the festivities, so you should take a look around. Admittedly, it would be an awful waste if she just left on account of a single incident. There was far too much that she might learn by staying. In that case, Ludmilla said, I should take up His Majesty on his offer. Where do you suggest I go first? 
The fighting tournament is at the arena and the festival is around there, too. It's two kilometers north of here. You probably won't be interested in the festival and the next set of matches is in the evening. How about we take a look at some things I was thinking of trying out in your area? I would like that, my lord, she replied. We'll be attending the tournament in the evening, I presume? Un, Lord Mayor nodded. Lord Ines will be there, so no one will miss it. Since it was an arena, hopefully she could sit somewhere far away from his majesty. She wouldn't be able to live with herself if she put on another shameful display in front of the sorcerer king. The three elf maids collectively glared a hole in Ludmilla's back as they made their way out of the room. Ludmilla wasn't sure why they were so antagonistic towards her and she wasn't sure that she wanted to know. At the least, asking would likely trigger another wave of hatred and resentment towards her and she didn't want to waste any time dealing with it. They followed a tunnel-like corridor that looked like it had been bored through wood rather than constructed. Ludmilla traced her fingers along the wall, feeling its grain as they descended a spiral staircase. This house has some very peculiar construction, she said. It's not peculiar, human, one of the elf maids jumped on her statement. Lord Mayor has one of the finest houses we've ever seen. That's right, a second elf maid added. It's far more beautiful than any human home. Do they intend to take issue with every other thing that I say? If Lord Mayor thought anything of their opposition to her existence, he didn't show it. He led them through a cozy sort of drawing room with an attached kitchen then outside through a rounded door. Ludmilla was surprised to find out that the building that they had been in was, in reality, a huge tree. The tree was wider than it was tall, and its massive boughs extended dozens of meters from its thick trunk. I'm amazed to see that a tree could survive such an ordeal, Ludmilla said. What kind of techniques were used to fashion the dwelling within? Um. Lord Mayor is a great druid. The blue-haired elf said. Don't underestimate him just because he's young, said the blonde-haired elf. In various ways, the redhead said. That doesn't answer my question. The only thing their heated defense gave away was that druids were capable of such a feat. She knew they had magic that could shape wood, but could it be done to such an extent? Will Glaza be able to do something similar in the future? Ludmilla asked. It's hard to say, Lord Mayor answered. Aren't you already using transmutation spells to reform materials in Warden's Veil? We are, Ludmilla replied, but they've only been used to recycle materials. Glaza is still hesitant to use it on living things. Why? Because she's afraid that she'll hurt them. Lord Mayor stopped and stared blankly at her for a moment. Oh. Oh? I it's nothing, Lord Mayor resumed walking. Um, you don't think it's silly? Professionals in agriculture often guide and shape the growth of plants, Ludmilla said. I suppose they don't think of their work as harmful. I think Glaza is mostly worried about making a mistake with her tree, which is understandable. She is connected to it, after all. Didn't you propose that we manage the growth of Glaza's tree, anyway? Yes, the modified Deus Yugi technique that you explained to me sounds promising, but I haven't broached the topic with Glaza yet. I feel that we've built up a lot of trust, but her tree is still a sensitive subject. Since Glass's tree was supposed to grow to a colossal size, it was clear that the direction of that growth would have to be managed. The technique that Lord Mayor spoke of was similar to polliding, except it was used on a tree's branches to create natural platforms that could be used to cultivate wood for harvesting. With some adjustments to the technique, the boughs of the tree could act as the upper layers of the city, with entire communities nestled in its leaves. Above all else, Lord Mayor was hopeful that high-tier materials would be possible to cultivate in and around the divine ash, including wood from the tree itself. Ludmilla similarly sought to cultivate greater levels of technical expertise in her subjects so they would be able to work with those materials. Needless to say, her military training also factored this in, though since it already focused on bow and polearm mastery, it didn't result in much of a shift from what she was already doing. They went to the northern edge of the meadow, following a stream that flowed northwest from the clearing. As Ludmilla expected, the woodland that they traversed displayed the hallmarks of a well-managed forest rather than something like the untamed wildlands around Warden's Vale. Once in a while, she spotted dens and litters where Lady Aura's companions made their homes. Is this forest capable of supporting all of Lady Aura's companions? She asked. Of course, Lord Mayor answered. Usually, everything balances out but our security spending has been lowered recently. 
We've been using the surplus to run a few experiments around the floor. Would this be the reason why you're so supportive of my style of development? Yes. After arriving in Nazarick, it slowly became apparent why the Sorceress Kingdom's central administration never challenged the way that Ludmilla did things. Unlike human realms, which were driven by competition over scarce resources in the pursuit of what could be broadly defined as growth, Nazarick's territories seemed to revolve around maintenance. Industries existed to sustain operations rather than fuel expansion. The way that Ludmilla managed her territory just happened to be conceptually the same as Nazarick and thus the correct way of doing things. Out of curiosity, Ludmilla asked, how would you justify this sort of economy to those who favor more aggressive development policies? Why would I need to do that? Lord Mayor asked, things are the way that they are because they're supposed to be that way. Let's just say that someone confronts you over it. How would you settle your differences? Um, I'd kill them, I meant in a non-violent way. I can't exactly go around killing other nobles for disagreeing with my policies. It's your area. They have no right to say anything about how you manage it. I guess if they really wanted to, they could complain to Shiltia. Why are you so worried about it? Rather than worry, Ludmilla said, I feel that this is something we'll come across often in the future. Immediate survival or at least the idea of what ensures immediate survival dominates the thinking of nearly every society that I know of. If the Sorcerer's Kingdom is to preside over an eternal hegemony, then we either must account for the conflicts that this sort of thinking leads to or lead the societies of our client states away from it. MMH, that's complicated. You should ask Lord Dines about it. He'll definitely have a perfect answer for you. If I can stay in control of myself, perhaps. Far be it for her to grasp His Majesty's thoughts in their entirety. She simply wanted to understand her small part of things so she could serve him well. Accomplishing just that was more than enough to make her happy. Their stroll through the woods abruptly ended when they arrived at a circular clearing not unlike that of a frontier holding. A cluster of log cabins lay at the center of a hodgepodge of cultivated fields. A mix of residents from several races could be seen around the buildings or out tending to the land. Ludmilla examined the border of the forest and the fields with a frown. Was this area recently cleared for agriculture? She asked. A couple of years ago, Lord Mayor answered. Reducing security allowed us to set aside some resources for experiments with local crops. This part of the floor is called the Green Hole. The people that live here are pretty much all from the great forest of Tob. Lizardmen, dryads, and, treants? What are you having them do here? They are basically farmers, Lord Mayor said. We've split them up into different tendencies, sort of like how it's done in your area. Each one is monitored for improvements over time. Have there been any results, my lord? There have. Lord Mayor nodded, most of the fields display the enhancing effects of the farmer job class that we've seen out around the Sorcerer's Kingdom. They're still cultivating mundane crops, but we've already had some interesting results. Lord Mayor wandered off as he spoke, bringing them to a barren-looking field halfway along the path to the village. He gestured with his staff to the huge rosette of leaves in the center. It looks like a carrot, Ludmilla said. At least if carrots grew to that size. It is a carrot, Lord Mayor told her. At least a carrot that grew to that size. The dark elf boy shrank away slightly as Ludmilla peered at him. His three maids immediately sprang into action, forming a barrier of bodies between them. Don't bully Lord Mayor. Such disrespect. Lord Mayor, please punish this insolent human. Ludmilla turned her gaze back to the carrot. Only its top was sticking out of the ground. Going just by what she saw, however. It was at least as large as an adult human. Is this some foreign breed of carrot? She asked, a magical carrot, perhaps? No, it's just a regular carrot, Lord Mayor answered. We had some of the plant type heteromorphs infuse the carrot with nutrients using their special abilities. After a certain point, it transformed into that carrot. That's quite impressive, Ludmilla said. I knew that magic could stimulate plant growth, but not to that degree. It was by now well known amongst the farmers of the Sorceress Kingdom that the spells used on their crops resulted in yields that were half again that what they once considered a bumper crop, but it didn't result in any produce even remotely approaching the scale before them. We are not sure what happened, either, Lord Mayor squeezed out from between his maids to stand beside Ludmilla again. One second, it was a regular carrot. The next, it became that thing. How strange wait, what? 
I, I said it transformed, didn't I? I thought it was a figure of speech, Ludmilla said. Is the carrot edible? It should be, Lord Mayor replied. They're still performing tests on the carrot and the field that it's in. Divination spells say that it's just a big, high-quality carrot. It doesn't have any magical effects and there isn't anything toxic to humans in it. If prepared properly, Ludmilla said, this is enough carrot for an entire village. The field that it grew in isn't looking so great, either. How large would it be if it had good soil to grow in? Uh, actually, the field is like this because of the carrot. Ludmilla examined the pitiful-looking parcel of land. It looked like the result of a foolish farmer who didn't rotate their crops properly out of blind greed. That doesn't make any sense, my lord, Ludmilla said. A single carrot doesn't have such an extensive root system. Yeah, Lord Mayor agreed, that's a part of why we're not sure what's going on here. This soil can't be used again until it's been left fallow for long enough or we use magic to replenish its nutrients. The only thing I can think of that explains what's going on is that you're limited to a single carrot of this size per field. Is it worth it? The Dark Elf shook his head. Based on what we have available to us, it's not economically viable. You need specialists to induce the transformation of each carrot and then you need someone to restore the land. The overall mana efficiency is just bad. We're still repeating the experiment to try and figure out the principles behind it, but the participants aren't very well versed in magical theory. They're just plant heteromorphs using their natural abilities. It may be worth it if applied to a higher tier crop, Ludmilla mused. I I think so, too. It's going to take time to find out, though. The people here aren't skilled enough to cultivate second tier crops yet. What level do they have to be for that? As far as I know, Lord Mayor said, they should follow the same rules as other production job classes. It feels really hard to level farmers, though. It's been two years and they still keep failing. Is that something that can fail, my lord? It isn't as if farmers are necessary for plants to exist. So long as it has the right conditions for growth, a plant should thrive on its own. Lady Shiltier's domain had multiple crops growing here and there with little in the way of supervision or expertise. That's because they were set up to grow there, Lord Mayor told her. The green hole is cultivated from scratch by its tenants. You may be onto something about needing the right conditions, though. I'll have to read up on it. They left the strange carrot and continued on their way to the nearby village. The residents, a few dozen lizardmen, came out to greet Lord Mayor as they stepped into the village square. Welcome, Lord Mayor, a dark brown male came forward with a bow. Is there something we can do for you today? I'm just showing Baroness Saradnik around, Lord Mayor replied. How come you're not at the festival? Things wound down after the stage production, the lizardman said. We figured we could take a nap or something before the fights tonight. Oh. Okay. We're going through to the other side. Bye. The lizardman bowed deeply as Lord Mayor continued on his way. Several minutes of walking brought them into the orchard tended by treants and dryads that she had seen from a distance. The nearest Trent ambled forward to greet them with a creaky nod and the dryad riding on his shoulder hopped down to genuflect before Lord Mayor. Good afternoon, Lord Mayor, she said. To what do we owe the pleasure of your visit today? Ludmilla noted the sterile construction of the dryad's greeting, wondering what it was she had actually said. We are just looking around, Lord Mayor replied. This is Baroness Ludmilla Zaradnik, one of Shiltier's new area guardians. The dryad rose to her feet and dusted off her knee, looking up at Ludmilla curiously. Much like Glaza, she had the supernatural charm of her kind, though her features were that of the oak trees more commonly associated with dryads in folklore. You look like a human, the dryad said, but, have we met before? In the dream between wakings, perhaps? I'm sorry, Ludmilla replied, I don't know what you're referring to. Would you mind explaining what that is? Oh. Ah. Uh, I'm not sure how to explain it. We dryads awaken into existence. The time between existences is the dream between wakings, I guess. Are you talking about some sort of dryad afterlife? No? Well, maybe. It's just where everyone goes between cycles of existence. It's after one, before another, and between all of them. Had she tripped over some strange aspect of dryad religion? Glaza had never mentioned anything of the sort. After a moment's thought, Ludmilla decided that it wasn't all that strange. One could say that the world was built out of countless interrelated cycles. Druids, rangers, 
and beings that were close to nature were keenly aware of those cycles, incorporating them into their activities and outlook on life in general. Are you saying that we persist after death and eventually awaken as a new existence? Ludmilla asked. Probably. What do you mean probably? Ludmilla sent a questioning look in Lord Mayor's direction. The dark elf druid shrugged. It makes sense to me, he said. Whenever I die, I just wait for Lord Dines to call me back. I'm not sure if anything happens between, though. If he put it that way, it made a bit more sense. Sir Sana determined the fate of one's soul, after all. I didn't know that Dryads saw things that way, Ludmilla said. That's very interesting, um. The Dryad stared at Ludmilla as her voice trailed off. It's Pinnison, Lord Mayor said. Me? Oh, yes. I am Pinnison. Pinnison Polperlia, Chief of the Green Hole. It's a pleasure to make your acquaintance, Chief Perlia, Ludmilla replied. Does that mean you're the area guardian of the Green Hole? The Green Hole isn't an actual area, Lord Mayor told her. It's technically a part of the Field of Flowers, but the Field of Flowers doesn't have an area guardian. Pinnison was the first person to move here, so she put herself in charge of everyone else. I see, does that make her a dryad lord? Me? A lord? Well, there's an all-rounder lord, so maybe there's a dryad lord? For some reason, Chief Perlia let out an unsteady laugh. Ludmilla fervently prayed that Glaza wouldn't grow up to be like her, 